Well, I'll start off with an introduction. Um, here I am in Colorado. It's the morning, so uh, but I'll wish you all a good afternoon or a good evening, depending upon where you are. Um, Doug DePep out of uh, Colorado, um, as Ora has mentioned, um, principally a data attorney. Um, some of that is in data sports, quite a bit in data protection, data privacy, uh, something I'll talk more about briefly later of uh, data property law, which I think is an emerging space. So that's a quick introduction of me, my practice, uh, EOS has legal. We're, we've been a partner to our global for, since 2017 in the cybersecurity space. So with that, I'm going to give an, a little presentation on artificial intelligence for practitioners. Let me share my screen. And hopefully I can go full screen here. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, okay. So artificial intelligence for practitioners, some best practices, some risks to be aware of, trends, um, that sort of thing. I think I've got about 20 minutes and then uh, leave 20, 10 minutes for, for questions and answers. So I wanna jump into it. Um, I think to start, we have to get our arms around what is artificial intelligence or AI. Yeah, you may, if you've looked at it all, um, seen a number of these phrases, maybe not all of them, and getting an, it's, I think it's important um, to understand the risks associated with it in terms of your use of it in practice to first understand um, the nature of it. Um, and I'll explain why in a second, but these are different terms associated with, with AI. So let's talk about what it is. At a very broad level, um, AI, of course, is is a advanced stage of computing, and generally, computing operates under the framework of if this, then that. So, and we're going left to right, then down, left to right. Um, also known as input output. So, you software is developed this way. Um, you know, there's a phrase, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you don't do a good job, you're not, the output is not going to be usable and can, can also be wrong. But this is generally algorithmic um, programming. And on the machine learning side, on the last slide, I mentioned it was noted there, machine learning. Um, that's a low level of, of AI moving to the right. There's some dispute in the industry of these terms and what truly is artificial intelligence. It's a philosophical question. There are, there's a Turing test. There are some tests that seek to define AI, um, but at, at a broad level, you know, basic understanding, it's the notion that a machine can think like a human. And so it gets into advanced reasoning, abstract reasoning and the like. So that's true artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of it is though machine learning and it's very useful still. I think the, the bigger risks that we'll talk about a little bit is the more advanced it gets, the more it behaves or purports to behave like uh, human intelligence uh, because it's not truly something that can be replicated. That's when it gets into some problem areas. And I'll just give you like an insider example of that. Um, and it, I mean, it gets into this input output, just so you understand the nature of it. When we, when humans think we get into abstract ideas many times, right? So you could, you could have a, a machine or, or go through a human process of decision-making left to right input output. Um, and it may not be that complex, but when you introduce ethical decision-making, right, or uh, other nuances, then there's a lot more variables where an engineer, you know, uh, we, we joke about engineers sometimes of, you know, the humans get in the way, right? If you want to design something that works, um, you can do that, but it's these nuanced uh, considerations in the decision-making that gets very complex. And I'll mention the 
in New York, the uh, a lot of publicity about a, almost a year ago now of the attorney, uh, Schwartz, I believe was his name, and, and he got sanctioned where he submitted a brief that he relied upon an AI program to write it. And it, it, it hallucinated, which is a, a well-known defect in AI. It made it up, right? It made up the citations. And so to give you, again, insight into how AI is developed and the training that goes into it, you know, the question that came to me was, how is it possible that an AI system made up cases? Like it doesn't, how does that happen if you're, if you're training it and you're putting in proper input? And I, and I don't know that this is the case, but just a way of thinking about it that I think is proper is as these advanced systems get developed and more nuanced considerations go in the input, well, in the practice of law and many other fields, it's better to win, right? So part of the input is perhaps here's how court systems work and here's the advantages to the winner. And the AI system, presumably, you know, in order to win, made it up, right? So these are how these different programming inputs, the training uh, is in, affects the output um, and, and the problems with, with uh, thinking ostensibly like, like a human. But what it's good for down at the bottom left are uh, examples diagnostic medicine, right? Because it's very much if this, then that. So you think about uh, diagnoses, you know, you're looking for factors, you're looking for conditions. If this, then it could be these possible um, um, ailments, right, or diseases. And the more questions you ask of it, the more you can narrow it down. That's very much if this, then that. Um, pattern. It's very good at pattern detection, repetition. It can even very effectively um, perform advanced decision trees. So we've seen those workflow diagrams, right? Where it, it, it poses a question, yes or no. If it's a, it's a no, it goes in this direction. Uh, if it's a yes, the diagram goes in a different direction and, and is a workflow that, that comes out of that with all sorts of additional, if, uh, if this, then that, you know, yes, no questions. So it's perfectly fine to perform those tasks. Um, it's where you get into the advanced reasoning that it can still perform it, but we as practitioners have to be especially um, thoughtful about those uses. So I think this, this quick background helps, it helps you um, perhaps think about your uses, because that's really what we want to get to, to have this in the back of your mind is this is how the system works. So when, am I more in the advanced thinking area and, and what sort of controls do I need to put in place to manage that risk? So some examples of, of advanced decision trees where uh, AI works, generally speaking, perfectly fine, even with large data sets. So if you think of tax, uh, I know we've got immigration attorney on as well, virtually any compliance matter, there's a stage of it where it's if this, then that, you know, are you this, are you that? But then there are exceptions, right? And th those sort of additional variables, additional questions, that's, it's perfectly fine. Um, systems, uh, AI systems can perform that even at advanced levels. Um, now, getting into having AI write something for you, again, in many cases, it's, it's very artful. I've used it. Uh, I've used it for research. I've done my own research and then checked uh, chat GPT, for example, even uh, the earlier version three. And it, it provides excellent results and it, and it provides for me a check on without having to do the traditional research. It's a quick check on what I believe is true from the research I've done and it, and it verifies it for me or gives me confidence that I'm on the right track. Um, now, doing a complete brief, not to say you shouldn't do it. I know people that are doing it. It's just more you have to check, right? All right, so you want to use AI. How do you use it? What, what are the considerations? Um, 
this is just some, these are just some quick pointers to consider. The first one, I think if you um, unpack your workflow, you'll be able to identify areas, given what I mentioned about if this, then that, and, and risk areas where it's not high level thinking that's going into it. It's more rote or mundane tasks. Um, and those typically for, for practitioners, mostly lawyers, but others as well, early in the stage of representation, um, fact finding, uh, the, the general area of the law, I mean, less risk at those stages because you haven't really formed a judgment on a course of action, right? So uh, it's a good stage to use AI to be more efficient. Um, then the next bullet, uh, main bullet, uh, match AI attributes to workflow characteristics. Um, so those items I mentioned where it's engaged in, in uh, tasks that it's well suited for, pattern detection, decision tree logic, repetitive tasks, that sort of thing. Um, low risk in utilizing AI for those tasks. And even in increased efficiencies, use of forms, uh, client intake, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that coming forward here. Um, and other things that are mundane, that low value to you, take up your time or your staff's time, it's essentially automating it through AI, all excellent uses. Um, now, when you start to use it for more advanced stages, and I am not suggesting that you do not, um, you, you just have to check it. And there's this phrase that we use in cybersecurity that's a useful consideration for how you approach managing risk with any technology. It's people, process, and technology. Um, it, you have people errors, uh, technology errors, system errors, process, those sorts. So if you think about it from those three categories, you should be able to spot the risks and then um, manage them. Here's a, a common fear, especially for folks um, around my age, you know, the technology is moving so fast. We didn't grow up with it. Uh, my kids are, you know, very nimble with using their smartphones and different tools. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty clunky uh, comparatively, but I've learned that you've got to get over the fear and just practice, just explore. Um, and so like anything, it's practice, practice, practice. You won't get good. You won't get proficient unless you, unless you don't experiment. Um, on using, using it and how it works. And I think many of you uh, are using it already uh, and you, you recognize that it is not like Google. And what I mean by that, Google, Bing, it, although Bing now has Bing chat, so it's using AI. The, we all have become you know, somewhat expert in stepping back before a Google search and thinking, how am I going to craft this query so I get the the best results and it tends to be a very in my experience a very refined question so to narrow your results um the best practice for ai is not to search that way to start broader um even abstract you know what are the what's the field we're we're dabbling in that you're researching in and and then iterate Meaning, and if you haven't used it, I think again, many many of you have. But you open up a a field and you ask a question, and it stays open, and it's it's in it's saved as that category, you know, that you and then you can ask another question. So it's a little bit. And I, all of us, I'm sure, have used chatbots where you get a string. You know, you ask a question, you ask a follow up question. Some are, some are better than others. Uh, those bots, but it's. Uh, it's a narrative, right? It's a follow-on question. That's that's the iteration that, and I've done it a lot with ChatGPT. It narrows it, it narrows it, start broad, you get specific toward the end and you get very good results. Um, so it's not a one, one quick question to get a result. Uh, there's many out there. We'll talk a little bit more about some of them. I'll give you some examples. One of the questions I get a lot on this topic is, What's the best one for accounting? What's the best one for tax? What's the, I don't answer those because I think you have to do your own exploration. Um, and I'll show you also what's happening in the field. So you get an idea. 
of why it's important for you to do your own due diligence, there are lots of platforms. Um, so what's happening in Silicon Valley and around the world, there's a, there is this race to win AI. Um, capital markets, uh, vent, the venture industry in California is pretty slow right now, except in AI. There's a, and I'll show you a slide here in a second. There are lots of startups creating new technologies. Um, again, I'll show you in a couple of slides. It's just amazing the many tools that are available that are, that are uh, built upon AI. So do your own research. Find um, and it takes some time. You know, put put someone in charge of researching what is useful for the task you have in mind. There's a lot of options. So let's just kind of go through this to give you an idea. This is I'm not endorsing any of these. Um, I've used some in these categories, but running it down. So the first one, Rafa. Um, you have investment experts. Like, again, not sure I trust it, but you want to find out what to invest. You know, there's a tool out there to tell you where, what to where to invest. Um, Producing video using avatar, um, so virtual videos. Um, business development, success AI, you know, through, you can automate um, outreach through uh, uh, emails, not something that lawyers typically do, but th this is out there. Um, translation, um, how do you like to have your own assistant, right? An AI assistant, I'm not sure I'd want that either, but uh, it's available, products, research, um, again, business development, boost your customers use, using an AI assist for customer support. Um, one of the things that's growing is this rely, not, not the company, but this notion of coding and writing script. So some of the automated things I mentioned, um, there are systems out there that will write the script for you. Um, so for simple tasks, it's you may not have to hire a developer. And this is some of the risks, right, too, that, that people are concerned about is putting people out of work. Um, but anyway, there's that that system. Um, you, you have poor resolution on an image. There's one that will improve it through AI. And sales, right, supercharger sales. So just to give you, this was just a quick sampling I went through. Uh, these are apps that are out there for every idea, every purpose under the sun. It's just amazing. Um, where are we with law? Well, I think the, the most uh, advanced one or most well-known is the um, in the EU. Uh, it's taken a regulatory approach. It's protecting consumers. Uh, when I say GDPR-like, you, you do have access to it. They have to disclose some things. There, there are areas of um, the AI Act or areas of risk that require approval. Um, so that's, and it's not fully in effect yet. It's, it's starting to be rolled out. Um, it'll take a couple of years to be fully rolled out in, in the UAE, since this is a, uh, MENA, um, group, uh, there is a, a committee in, I think Abu Dhabi that's looking at it. They're studying frameworks. There's no, uh, regulation or law yet there. Other countries in the region are completely restricting access. Um, I've seen some of that elsewhere as well. Um, so do your search research on whether it's permissible in your location, um, but it's just starting in terms of of the regulation of it. Um, generally, there are there's there's disclosure requirements around, and this is why I started with input output. Uh, if this then that, they the regulators want the AI developers the tools to disclose how their system is trained because um, there are biases in the training, um, other uh, risks, especially to professionals. Um, so it has, you know, the training generally has to be disclosed. Um, and then down at the bottom, there's this concern, and this is certainly in the United States, um, you know, usually an entrepreneurial uh, capitalist market. There's this concern about do you regulate or do you, you know, how is the best way to promote innovation while also managing the risks? Um, and that's also called some, caused some stalling of regulation. Um, all right, so to actually use it, some tips here, and I'll share this uh, slide as well, slides as well, um, but uh, 
I, this is, there is a lot of risk. There's a lot of benefit. What I think you don't want, and it's probably already happening, are staff who are experimenting using firm resources. That's that's a problem um, because you don't know. It, it's going back to this phrase in cybersecurity, bring your own device. Um, and so bring your own device, hook it up to the network problem, right? That's now been tamped down in the cybersecurity world. Same kind of issue with AI. Um, you may or may not know this, but you can uh, license, purchase use, and put an AI system in your environment in a closed loop environment. So then you're not on the open internet. Um, even though you'll have an account, um, it, it, it's better to be on a closed loop system. So if there's mistakes, it's in your system, it's in your environment. And you so client data, you don't want to have staff putting client data, privacy data um, in an AI platform. Little less risk if if it's your AI system that's uh, within your your environment. Being a cybersecurity attorney, it's again, it's the attack surface. The attack surface is a is a term meaning. What are all the ways that someone can get in? And so if you're integrating with AI systems, you know, that's a new integration and new risk. So assess that. The, the whole committee idea, I think, is important to, and you need to have an inter, interdisciplinary team, not just your privacy attorney or privacy compliance expert, but um, obviously technology, uh, security, and so on. Um, but you just don't want to leave it to chance because of the the the, the known problem of, of hallucinations. Uh, namely, it, it will make things up, especially at the more advanced stages um, of things that you're asking it to do. And that's why you need to have human oversight. So risk management there is a reference to having uh, human oversight of the more advanced tasks given the prior slide. Now, some cool uses. Um, so this is something that a, um, a colleague, uh, has done. I'm involved with some of these things as well. So what this, this is a chat to video production, generative AI capability. So bottom left, you can see it's over four minutes long. It's an animated video with, it's showing what happened in the Seoul Olympics. And that's a, a sample query where you can ask it to produce something. Now, it won't produce it, depending upon the system, it may not produce something four minutes long. This was more of a written narration, right? Slide by slide that produced an over four minute um, video. So tremendous for marketing, right? And there on the right is an example of some of the, the clips um, from the production. And one of the requirements or best practices is to reveal that it's been produced by generative AI, particularly if you have caricatures of or avatars of people or, or very real looking um, people, you know, having that description, um, probably a best practice. Also, again, check your jurisdiction to actually mention which platform was used. Um, so that anyone who's interested can check and see how it's trained and some of the issues. Um, I, I I will say this, I kind of like perplexity. So here are the ones, some of the ones you've heard of, some maybe you haven't. Uh, I thought with the last slide, you might be interested in um, video production for marketing. So here are some examples. Again, no, no endorsement. Perplexity is interesting because it does have citations, whereas chat GPT, at least three, does not have citations. Um, and I think uh, for those who really are fascinated and, and want to maximize the use of AI, the, the best practice is to license use, download it on your platform in a closed loop environment. Um, just about uh, finishing up, um, I want to introduce an entirely different way of managing risks. I'm uh, deeply involved in this. It's more of a Web3. So Web3 is the next iteration of um, it's not really the internet, it's Web3. But, but Web2 right now is uh, known for platform um, computing. So think Google, think Meta, Facebook. 
where you create a profile and then the company monetizes your data. Um, Web3 will enable you to control your data. So now go, you know, we may not have market power, but going on the Google, um, you bring your own identity, you know, your own wallet. And through that, you control its use. So it's very much aligned um, with GDPR, except you're controlling it. You, they're not disclosing to you, your license gets to them. It, it flips it on its head. Will you have market power to enforce that? Maybe not. Will it happen over time when um, superstars start demanding that and laws and regulations start to change? I believe so. And then um, it's not just the control of your data through a wallet, but actually claiming ownership and um, enforcing misuse. So you misuse, you license its use on the distributed ledger, which is blockchain. And so then either it's on the ledger or it's not, meaning if it's not on the ledger as a transaction, the license use, then it's an unauthorized use. So then you get into enforcement of misuse. If you're a celebrity, you may uh, want others to use your name, image, likeness, as we call it, you know, in the US or image rights. You just want to get paid for it. So now you're able to shut down, cease and desist, perhaps notice and take down for misuse of, of um, infringing uh, data that's owned. So that's, I think, a uh, new way to go about it. Uh, I've got a patent pending for a global registry of ownership claims. Um, so all of the risk, so not all the risks, many of the extreme risks you hear about AI, uh, we had the Screenwriters Guild, Actors Guild strikes um, last year that settled about uh, getting an image and then replicating that image, you know, a, a human likeness, right? And just repeating it. Um, and those individuals losing uh, appearance rights, right? And they're just, they're cast, they're the background. Um, and they settled that, they arranged some... Uh, uh, I guess mutually agreeable terms, but that knockoff of someone ide someone's identity can be addressed if that identity owns their rights. So that's the idea. All right, um, I'll stop there and open it up to Q and A. Thank you very much, dude. It was really interesting. First of all, uh, I like you to have some questions. If you don't have questions, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, can I can I ask a question, Doug? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so in the case you just talked about the actors and the use of their image rights and so on, what, what happened there? Did they come to a settlement or did they um, step back from, um, how you say, using the technology? A little bit of both. There was a settlement. Um, uh... I don't have the terms. I read a story, an article on it. Um, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but it was that there. It, it is allowed to still be used in Hollywood with with restrictions. Um, they did not pursue the Web three approach I mentioned. Um, I think that will emerge. I mean, it was a strike, right, and that was settled. Um, sure, certainly, there can be more um, strikes as an, an enforcement as. Uh, these new technologies emerge. I, I guess the, the other question there, you know, I, I don't think we're likely to um, slow down the adoption of AI. I think we're going to have more and more um, risks. And for example, in my space, cybersecurity, um, both the offense and the defense, because it's very good at, um, pattern detection and advanced computing. Um, attackers are using it to uh, create new malware, um, new attack schemes, scanning systems and seeing where the vulnerabilities are and, and automating that whole attack environment. On the defense side though, um, all attacks attempt to be efficient. So repeating the same exploit in, in similar manner. And so AI is really expert at detecting that. So it's, but we, we're going to see those kind of malicious uses of AI more and more. Yep, Edward. Edward. Yes, just out of interest from a practical point of view, Doug, um, can you recruit people now who have 
i.e. AI knowledge and experience? Or if you were starting your own firm now, do you say, no, you've got to be more involved yourself first to understand the possibilities? How would you approach it? Great question. Um, I, I think it's overcoming that fear and... You, Sorry for my uh, language choice, but, you know, the jargon here in the U.S., you know, the bullshit factor, right? You won't know if someone is blowing smoke at you if you have no inkling of what the space is about, right? So I definitely think some due diligence, even bringing on a consultant, if, if necessary, to kind of educate you on, on the key considerations, the key risks, um, outsourcing it entirely. No, it, it, no one is, th there are experts, I would say, be unfair, unfair to say there are not experts, but it's advancing so fast that, um, you know, the state of the, of the art, state of the craft, uh, it changes in months. So. Thank you. Others. Uh I have one comment and one question. One comment is that the European Data Protection Group, NOIP, just filed a complaint against JetGPT for breaking uh, data protection rules because JetGPT is inventing uh, stories about uh, persons. He had was an Austrian citizen. So it will mm -hmm. be interesting how this goes on with JetGPT. And another question is, um, do you have already experienced how you charge your client in the future? Because right now, Some... you charge your client fees. Right. Because you're right. saving time. Um, but in the end of the day, our clients, they're not that stupid. So they will use ChatGPT or any other AI in the future too. So right now, you could charge maybe, okay, you save four hours. I charge them four more hours more that I haven't really done or how do you plan to work with it in the future? Yeah. I mean, I've talked to a number of attorneys um, that are using it uh, aggressively. In fact, um, Gen AI, right. Um, uh, one of our uh, 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 colleagues in, in um, uh, our global, they, I think it was two systems that they used. One was chat GPT for, and then they also involved another AI system, but they, and I know we have an immigration lawyer on, so if you're interested, uh, I can make a, a introduction for you, but they created an immigration law, um, US law, um, but it, it could be adopted and, and, and changed, I'm sure, but um, an immigration AI system that is now a business and their, their firm also uses it, so they are onboarding law firms to use it as a resource because it simplifies and, and makes it more efficient. Um, that's an innovative way of using AI and it's all closed loop. You know, they, they develop their own system based upon those platforms. Um, but to more directly answer your question, or is I think that, I'm sorry, one other attorney has mentioned to me in the IP space, uh, doing patent searches, you know, automating the patent search, um, also in trademark space. So there are different stages that he, and again, it's an IR global attorney. Um, there are stages where I believe 80, 90% of his early stage work is using AI to make him more efficient. So what he's not billing for that, I mean, he may bill a little bit for that because there's a human oversight piece, but he's able to um, work multitask, have more clients, uh, you know, that he's working for at the same time um, as a result of increased efficiency. So that's one way of looking at it. One thing I wanted to mention to Alan that occurred to me on, on the um, getting a baseline of knowledge together uh, I'll just pass along again what I mentioned earlier about my experience as a technology attorney, particularly when I started in, in cybersecurity, is um, you have to ask questions 
and you come to find out that technology professionals, um, they have their own blinders on. And what they just think about AI, meaning they are not translating or, or extending the AI discussion onto privacy, security, you know, questions like Aura's question. In other words, there's a, there's the legal intersection that te technology professionals don't typically address. The legal intersection with technology, all kinds of issues emerge all the time. Thank you. Full view, you have a question. Yes, Doug, I have a question. Can you maybe help us uh, to have a better uh, understanding what could be, uh, or if you can tell us what are the most uh, popular use cases you have seen in the legal practice? Um, definitely research. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, as I mentioned, background research, like the the broad area, like you have a, a thought, not on a particular research topic, but on a course of action. And you want to know, is, is has this happened before? Um, so research, um, I, I have used it a little bit for drafting. Um, I know others have used it more. So uh, certainly form letters, that those kind of drafting, there's no problem with that. But I, I'm aware of, um, of, writing, you know, sections of a brief. Hmm. But it seems to be uh, up to now, uh, at least based on what you share with us, that uh, AI is more used uh, in a defensive way. I mean, in a limited risk uh, and uh, just to perform some ancillary activities. But uh, is there any use cases that you have already uh, seen that uh, is uh, trying to uh, reshape the business model in order to make uh, or to put AI application central to the future of the firm. I mean, the the two attorneys I mentioned, and I, um, and I can make an introduction, they are using it very aggressively. Um, uh, so I, you could... Can you reduce, not attorney staff, but uh, um, administrative staff? I mean, yeah, there's there's the also the issue of how do your clients perceive use of AI? You know, so I'm I'm talking yeah more on the administrative side. Um, I, I guess I'm still a little bit given my background in technology. Um, I do use it in in the functional aspects of the practice of law, like I said, with research and some writing, um, I've just seen too many um, problems caused by a technology centric approach to output that, that it's, you, you run the risk of not producing the same level of intelligent thinking and innovation, you know, that the human mind can create. So very useful for, I would, I, so my view is it's more on, it's more useful right now. And others do, as I mentioned, are getting very advanced and thinking about using it in more substantive practice of law ways. I'm more risk averse at that. Um, it'll happen, but um, I don't think I want to be an early adopter in an experiment. Mm -hmm. But based on what you mentioned before, for instance, one of the use cases was immigration law. So, for instance, uh, one uh, law firm uh, uh, made up uh, their own uh, knowledge base about immigration law in the States, and mm -hmm. then they, under brackets, resell the package to other immigration lawyers in the States. Is this correct? Yep, correct. Is this working? Yes. Yes. Um... I it's early stage. It's only six months or so. Uh, and so it's not advanced immigration law, but it, it does have, you know, an immigration law database involving their history and their uh, decisions and, you know, their research. Um, so a lot of it. So it saves a lot of time on research. 
I see. I see. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more questions? Yes, Urs. Hi. Hi, uh, hi Paul. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, Doc, uh, very nice to hear you. Uh, thank you for your pre presentation. My name is Paul. I'm, I'm talking from Portugal. Um, I'm the, the partner of a business consulting company. And as a business consulting, uh, uh, we 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 are in the early stage. We we, we start uh, in a simple way with mar marketing contents. And in a second step, we are trying to work in financial financial analysis. So my question is, um, if uh, what is your experience or information about uh, the financial analysis, PNL balance sheet uh, regarding uh, AI? Thank you. That is an excellent use case for it because it's it's repetitive and it's very much uh, input output. Um, I've seen some things, uh, um, and I believe some of the big, um, you know, investment uh, houses uh, in New York, for example, um, are using it in that manner. So there's probably I, I'm not sure if you were on when I started out, but I don't um, uh, recommend uh, any particular platform because I think everyone has to do their their due diligence. But they're out there. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Others? If there's no questions, I have to say thank you, Doc. It was, as always, very interesting. Maybe my experience is uh, we use it since January a lot. And I think we can save at least one junior associate with it. Uh, we are preparing, yeah, contracts, everything. However, you have to know your material because you have to check it and go through it. And at least what we've experienced, they don't, the, the AI has no, uh, in Germany, no access to any data bank with uh, actual judgment. So this is missing if you do the research right now. However, it gives you a good introduction or can you draft a contract? What I would say first, second, third year associate would do, but faster and a um, bit cheaper. Mm -hmm.